tonight, the left completely unhinged. And now they've turned violent. Michelle Malkin reacts. The president made it clear in this executive order that we are not going to compromise the safety and security of the American people. The Trump administration has put the world on notice. We went to the White House today to speak with Vice President Mike Pence. And President Trump is not your typical politician. I am a man of my word. I will do as I say. And lawmakers are feeling the heat. Laura Ingram is here to weigh in. All of that, plus Lou Dobbs is here. Hannity starts right here, right now. And welcome to Hannity. And tonight, Vice President Pence, Michelle Malkin, Laura Ingram will join us. But first, we are just 14 days into the Trump administration, and the left is completely unhinged, and now they're turning violent. And that is tonight's opening monologue. Last night, out of control protesters, they were rocking the campus of UC Berkeley out in California, capping off a chaotic two-week stretch of disruptive demonstrations. Now, UC Berkeley was forced to cancel a speech by Breitbart editor Milo Yiannopoulos after anti-free speech rioters, well, they started smashing windows, launching Molotov cocktails at police, and even setting part of the campus on fire, as you see there. Now, early this morning, President Trump responded to the violence. He tweeted out, quote, if UC Berkeley does not allow free speech and practices violence on innocent people with a different point of view, well, no federal funds, question mark. Now, the shocking public disorder at UC Berkeley comes after a week of protests all across the nation, some of which featured agitators calling for violence against President Trump and the White House, including this person wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt at a protest that allegedly took place in Seattle. Watch this. White people, give your money, your house, your property. We need it all. You need us reparate. Black and indigenous people right now. We're all operating under white supremacy, just so you know. And we need to start killing people. First off, we need to start killing the White House. The White House must die. The White House, your White House, your president, they must go. White House die? Why has that person not been arrested? Now, sadly, these protesters were just following the lead of many prominent public figures on the left who have been having a complete meltdown since Donald Trump's victory in November. Now, this includes celebrity snowflakes like Madonna, Ashley Judd, who delivered these very disturbing remarks at a protest. This was one day after the president was sworn into office. We've got to warn you, this language is very graphic, very vulgar. Look for yourself. To our detractors that insist that this march will never add up to anything. F you. Yes, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. I am a nasty woman. I'm not as nasty as a man who looks like he bathes in Cheeto dust. I am not as nasty as your own daughter being your favorite sex symbol. Now, this type of language from the left is not going away. In fact, I predict this is only going to get worse. Now, Democrats in the U.S. Senate, as we speak, they are preparing a stiff resistance to the confirmation of Supreme Court nominee Neil Gorsuch. And if history repeats itself, well, this obstruction could be just as nasty and divisive, if not worse. For example, you might remember when President Reagan, his Supreme Court nominee, Judge Robert Bork, back in 1987, he was not confirmed by the U.S. Senate. After Democrats, they painted Bork as a sexist and racist, which he was not. And Senator Ted Kennedy said this about Bork on the U.S. Senate floor. Watch this disgrace. Robert Bork's America is a land in which women would be forced into back alley abortions. Blacks would sit at segregated lunch counters. Rogue police could break down citizens' doors in midnight raids, and school children could not be taught about evolution. Writers and artists would be censured at the whim of government. Now, after those lies and scare tactics were used by the left, Democrats, they were able to block Bork's nomination, and that's how we ended up with the term being Borked, and that's not all. In 1991, 
George Herbert Walker Bush. He nominated Clarence Thomas to the U.S. Supreme Court. And Democrats, they used similar dirty tactics. In fact, they had his former colleague, Anita Hill, testify and make unfounded sexual harassment claims against him. Now, Justice Thomas referred to this as a, quote, high-tech lynching. Watch this powerful moment from Clarence Thomas. And from my standpoint, as a black American, as far as I'm concerned, it is a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks who in any way deign to think for themselves, to do for themselves, to have different ideas. And it is a message that unless you kowtow to an old order, this is what will happen to you. You will be lynched, destroyed, caricatured by a committee of the U.S. US Senate rather than hung from a tree. Sad but extremely powerful. So as Democrats now gear up to smear Judge Gorsuch and his protests continue to disrupt the law and order all across the country, here's the question. Will the leaders of the Democratic Party call for an end to this violence, an end to the lies and the smearing and besmirchment and obstruction? Now, sadly, we probably won't get a call of unity from former President Obama. He had this to say about the widespread protests after this election. Listen to this. I would not advise people who feel strongly uh, or are concerned about uh, some of the issues that have been raised during the course of the campaign. I wouldn't advise them uh, to be silent. Well, don't be silent, and he encouraged the protesters. Now, meanwhile, the Stronger Together candidate, Hillary Clinton, has praised some of the recent protests on Twitter. And let me be clear here. This is important. President Obama, Hillary Clinton, Senate House Democratic leaders, if you continue to coddle this outrage, this behavior from your side of the aisle, then the repercussions of the violence and the anarchy, it will be on your hands. You're responsible. You're supposed to be leaders. Joining us now, the host of Michelle Malkin Investigates on CRTV.com, Michelle Malkin. Um, I don't think it's going to end. I would say with every item on Trump's agenda, what he promised the American people, if it's energy, if it's borders, if it's vetting, if it's a judge, if it's lower taxes, there's going to be the same reaction. I don't see this getting better. I see it getting worse. Your thoughts? I think you're right, Sean. And I think the montage that you showed of how this dates back decades and decades emphasizes that there's nothing new about this anarchy and that obstructionism is the middle name of the Democrat Party. And the middle name of the far left is by any means necessary. That has been their operational motto for three or four decades now. What happened at Berkeley has happened many, many times before. It's just uh, more in flames than it ever has been. I spoke in Berkeley at uh, uh, an event I was invited by the College Republicans in 2004. And my lecture hall had to be chained shut because there were hundreds and hundreds, throngs of students who, of course, were encouraged by uh, faculty members to try and shut me down. This is what the left does. And Clarence Thomas said it more powerfully uh, than anyone has in modern life about the uppity blacks and browns and yellows and reds uh, who have been suppressed by the left because their ideas and their expressions are so dangerous that you've got these leftists on campuses from Berkeley to the East Coast to everywhere in between threatening conservative speakers. Liberals, they call themselves the protectors of safe spaces, not if you're a conservative student, professor, or visiting speaker who needs to dress in riot gear to express yourself. You know, the free speech movement in America started in 1964 and 65 <laughs> in Berkeley but free speech only for liberals not for conservatives if they didn't want to hear from the guy that works for Breitbart they didn't have to go did they no of course they didn't um, but this climate of intolerance and this suppression of ideas with which they disagree is at the heart of um, what academia has been teaching. That's why you have these generations of crybabies and snowflakes who, who cannot 
cope in a world where they lose politically, ideologically, and culturally. Well, we move from the, we, uh, we need aromatherapy and puppy therapy and crayons <laughs> and coloring books and Legos. Uh, I guess this is the next stage of their reaction, which is anger. One of the reasons every four years, in an election year, I will play every election year. Republicans are racist and sexist and misogynist and xenophobic and homophobic and Islamophobic and I don't even know what else. But they do the same thing every year. This party seems to have no ideas, meaning the Democratic Party, but they're the party of character assassination. Last word for you. Yeah, they're not only ideologically bankrupt, they're morally bankrupt. How dare these people wag their fingers at their political opponents from the center to the right to libertarian uh, wing of America and tell us that we don't know what civility is, that we need to preach more tolerance. They need to look in the mirrors because they are absolutely responsible for it. Their noses are not clean and their hands are not clean. Where's Janet Napolitano, the former Homeland Security Secretary who's in charge of the UC system? Where are you? It's really up to the donors who have been floating the endowments of so many of these private university and colleges. Shame on you for funding and subsidizing this kind of anarchy across well, America. Michelle Malkin, thanks for being with us. CRTV.com, we appreciate it. Michelle Malkin investigates. When we come back, this is up next here on Hannity. What President Trump has done is essentially impose a pause on countries that have been compromised by terrorism so that we can evaluate uh, the screening process and establish uh, an extreme vetting so that people coming into this country don't represent a threat to our families and to our communities. Earlier today, I interviewed Vice President Mike Pence in Washington. I asked him about President Trump's temporary travel ban and much more that's coming up next. Also tonight, Laura Ingram, Lou Dobbs are here as we continue. Tonight, NYU due to an appearance by conservative actor Gavin McGinnis. He's also the co-founder of Vice Media. McGinnis was invited to attend a seminar sponsored by campus Republicans there. Protesters showed up in force to register their displeasure. Police made a number of arrests. I'm Jackie Abanez. Now, back to Hannity. Welcome back to Hannity. So the Trump administration, they're working hard to fulfill all the campaign promises that the president made to you, the American people. They seem to be checking them off the list. It's been a very busy week for the White House. And earlier today, I traveled to D.C. to speak with the vice president, Mike Pence. And here's the first part of that interview. Take a look. Mr. Vice President, how are you, sir? I'm great, Sean. Welcome to the Vice President's office and welcome to the White House. What a beautiful office. Number one, I saw a lot of signatures inside your desk, going back to Theodore Roosevelt, Dwight Eisenhower, even Al Gore and Joe Biden signed it, so That's I assume. Right. Um, this has been fast-moving administration. From you, you seem to be involved in every aspect of what has been happening. How close is the relationship now? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just very humbled. Uh, to be a small part of an administration uh, and a president who from the first hours of this administration have been keeping their promises to the American people. I have to tell you, right, right after the inaugural ceremonies, right after the parade was over, uh, I walked with the president and other members of our team into the Oval Office and he sat down and started taking immediate action. I think it's been a great encouragement to people all across the country to see that President Donald Trump is doing everything he said he would do throughout the campaign. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're just getting started. Let's talk about Democratic opposition. You've had a hard time getting some of your cabinet members through. Uh, I think a lot of Democrats are pretty dedicated to a filibuster to prevent Neil Gorsuch from getting on the Supreme Court. What is your reaction to that? Well, I got to tell you, it's been very disappointing to me to see the level of obstruction uh, that uh, that Senator Chuck Schumer and Democrats in the Senate have put forward with regard to our cabinet officials. We're pleased to see uh, Secretary of State uh, Tillerson uh, that was last night. Uh, approved and sworn in in the Oval Office. But look, if you compare to prior administrations, 
the, the, the pace at which Democrats in the Senate are forcing this process, I think, I think is a real disservice to the country. Yeah. And we're going to continue to drive forward. We're going to get the president's cabinet approved, and we're going to get that nominee to the Supreme Court approved. The American people want to see this country moving forward. They want to see this new president have the cabinet around him and have the appointments that uh, that he's determined and been elected to make, approved by the Senate. They have a role. They have a role to play, but that's not about obstruction. It's about advice and consent as appropriate. Uh, we respect that process, but uh, but we're we're uh, we continue to to drive this effort in every way possible because uh, President Trump deserves his cabinet, and he deserves it in the near term, uh, and uh, and the American people deserve. A new justice on the Supreme Court of the caliber of Neil Gorsuch. One of the big issues that has created a lot of controversy is executive action on extreme vetting in seven particular countries. It's been misreported as a Muslim ban. Chuck Schumer said it was mean-spirited and un-American. Now, there are some 40 other Muslim-majority nations that are not impacted. As a matter of fact, 90% of Muslims worldwide are not impacted by that. It, yet the news media continues to say it's a Muslim ban. Is that fake news to you? It, it, it really is. And any fair-minded person looking at the president's action knows that what President Trump has done is essentially impose a pause on countries that have been compromised by terrorism so that we can evaluate uh, the screening process and establish uh, an extreme vetting so that people coming into this country don't represent a threat to our families and to our communities. Uh, it's, it's an indefinite pause with regard to Syria, but with regard to the other countries, we're, we're going to be calling on uh, the Department of Homeland Security, all of our team to, to work together to, to evaluate how we, can, how we can continue to go forward with immigration from those countries, but not compromise the safety and security of the American people, but it clearly it's not it's not a Muslim ban. It's not in any way associated with religion. This the, the president made it clear in this executive order that we are not going to compromise the safety and security of the American people with regard to these seven countries that the Obama administration identified as compromised by terror, that, that the Congress has identified. We're going to take a pause, we're going to step back, and we're going to put the safety and security of the American people first. Don't we, shouldn't other countries with their history, maybe Saudi Arabia, for example, be included in that list? Well, as, uh, as, as uh, our, our Homeland Security Secretary, said this week in his briefing this is really this list is really garnered around whether the, the the countries that we're looking at have the internal systems that we can be certain that people are who they say they are and with regard to other countries Saudi Arabia being among them we we have confidence uh, that they have the kind of, uh, of, of safeguards, the kind of law enforcement, the kind of screening in their country that when a person presents a visa or attempts to come into the United States, that we know they are who they present as. These other countries, again, the Obama administration and the Congress have identified these seven countries as having systems that have been compromised through strife, through the advent of terrorism, in the case of Syria, through civil war, so that we need to step back to make sure that we have the additional safeguards. And I got to tell you, uh, uh, President Trump has a lot of priorities, but his number one priority is the safety and security of the American people. And that's why this decisive action took place. Doesn't it come down to really a simple choice between whether or not we will accept that some people are inconvenienced? And by the way, every American traveler, unless of course you have Air Force Two or Air Force One, um, but every American traveler is inconvenienced sure. for the safety and security of everyone else. Right. Is, it a, is it a choice between the inconvenience of some that want to come to our country versus gambling with the lives of the American people? I think it's exactly that choice. And it, at the end of the day, you know, the, on, on the very day the executive order was implemented, within the next 24 hours, there were hundreds of thousands of people that came in from countries all over the world into the United States, um, and I think uh, more than 100 were detained for additional questioning. That is a small price to pay for the security of the American people. I mean, look, we we live in very dangerous times. There. Are, 
are people all across the world who are engaged in unthinkable violence. The president spoke again about that this week at the National Prayer Breakfast. And I think what, what people welcome in this administration and they welcome in, in our new president is, is a clear-eyed look at the world, a recognition of the threat of radical Islamic terrorism to the United States and that we've just got to do things differently to make sure that our families and our communities and our nation is safe. At the prayer breakfast today, the president addressed that in the coming days, those admitted will fully embrace our values, religious, liberty values, etc., and respect, of course, uh, and reject um, uh, discrimination and, and other things. Is he, was he addressing in that sense that there is a cultural divide? If you grow up in a country and as a man you feel you have the right to tell a woman how to dress, that a woman can't drive a car, you decide as a man if a woman goes to work or, or school, if gays and lesbians are killed, if Christians and Jews are persecuted. Those values are so distinctly different and contradictory to our constitutional values. Do we have a right to know whether or not they want to come here and adopt our values? And how do you ever ascertain what's in somebody's heart? My, 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 uh, my grandfather immigrated to this country when he was about my son's age. And uh, he came here because he wanted to be an American. He wanted his children to be Americans and his grandchildren to be Americans. I can't imagine what that Irishman is thinking now as he looks down from glory. Other than he was right about America, that anybody can be anybody. But when, when my grandfather came here, it's because he, he loved and admired this country and he loved the ideals enshrined in our declaration and our constitution. That's what President Trump is talking about, is we want people who come to this country because they love, they love the values. ideals of America, they love our commitment to freedom, uh, our, our rejection of, of intolerance and oppression. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that's been true throughout our history. And up next tonight, right here on Hannity. The American people said we want to repeal Obamacare, and we're working, we're working with, with leadership in the Congress to do just that. More of our sit-down interview with Vice President Mike Pence, and also later tonight. I am a man of my word. I will do as I say. President Trump keeping his promises and shaking up Washington, D.C. with a little shock and awe. Laura Ingram is here with reaction and much more on this busy news night tonight here on Hannity. Welcome back to Hannity, and here's part two of my interview with Vice President Mike Pence from Washington earlier today. Let me ask you about Obamacare. There was a report in The Hill this morning that said Republicans are leaning towards repairing Obamacare rather than replacing Obamacare. Now, from my understanding is if Congressman Price becomes the Health and Human Services Secretary, which I assume will happen, apparently there's a lot of discretion within the law. Is there going to be a repair or is, are you still on replacement? We are absolutely committed to follow through on President Trump's directive to repeal and replace Obamacare and to have the Congress do it at the same time. So the media got it wrong again? Once again, <laughs> yeah. the President's made it very Shocking. clear. We, we're having ongoing discussions with leadership of the House and Senate, but this is the President's leadership, Sean, I got to tell you. I mean, Obamacare was very much on the ballot when we saw the hardship that it was placing on families across this country, on businesses across this country. Premiums going up, in some cases, more than 100 percent this year. 117 percent in Arizona. The American people said we want to repeal Obamacare, and we're working, we're working with, with leadership in the Congress to do just that. But what President Trump said, that at the same time that we repeal it, we're going to bring forward through legislation and, to your point, through executive action, the kind of replacement that'll harness the power of the free market, give Americans more choices, that'll drive down the cost of health insurance and make it affordable for everyone. And we're going to do it all at the same time. I noticed that you're with the president every day. You've been obviously an active part of the administration and what has been a very slow uh, <laughs> first two weeks, I'm kidding, a very busy two weeks. You've been with him side by side. He's also had many conversations with world leaders, including Vladimir Putin, Prime Minister Netanyahu, yes. the Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, Angela Merkel, and it goes on and on. You've been privy to these conversations. I have. There have been some many reports that there, some of these conversations were contentious. Is that accurate, or do you, did you find them friendly, straightforward? How would you? 
How would you describe them? Well, I think I think the American people have a president that is candid with them and candid with the world. And his conversations with world leaders reflect uh, a respectfulness, but a seriousness and directness that the people of this country are already used to coming from President Donald Trump. And the rest of the world is discovering that. Look, we, we've got a lot of challenges in the world. And in, in many respects, the last eight years, the United States abdicated leadership on the world stage in one region after another, in one relationship after another. And what, what President Trump has been about engaging with these world leaders is opening the door to conversations, to, mm -hmm. to look for ways that we could work together uh, with, with a focus on the American people first and America's interests first. But uh, he's speaking as the way he always does, uh, respectfully, firmly, directly, and mm -hmm. uh, frankly, I think the world welcomes it. I think a lot of people view part of your role as vice president, having been a Congress member for 12 years, you know a lot of the members of Congress is to be a bit of a liaison between the White House and the Congress as it moves forward with legislation. Before you were sworn in and the president was sworn in, Congress raised the debt ceiling $9.7 trillion. Mm -hmm. There's talk of a $1 trillion infrastructure spending bill. I know a lot of Americans, especially after Barack Obama accumulated more debt than all of the presidents before him combined, are worried about the debt, pay as you go, where does the money come from? Um, how do you think Congress is going to work with this president? Do they believe in his agenda? Many didn't support him during the campaign. How is, how is that relationship going and how do you see them working together? I, I think the relationship that the president has forged with not only the leadership but rank and file on Capitol Hill um, is going to serve the American people well. And, and with regard to all of these issues, uh, you know, the, President Trump said in the campaign that he has a three-part agenda, jobs, jobs, jobs. And we're focusing right now, whether it be repealing and replacing Obamacare, passing tax relief for working families and businesses, lowering the corporate tax rate in America. Will it be 15% what the president wants or 20% what well, the Well, we're talking wants. about all of that, but yeah. having the kind of trade deals that put the American worker first, all of these things, Sean, uh, are going to move forward in a way, I'm confident, that's going to get this economy moving again. Not at the paltry rate under 2% that it's been for far too long, but, but really getting the economy standing tall again. All these debates over spending and, and tackling the national debt, meeting the needs of infrastructure at home, rebuilding our military the president's committed to, all get a lot easier with a growing economy. And that's why uh, the president and our whole team are working with leaders in Congress to, to jumpstart this economy. Those, the, 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 the executive orders that he signed rolling back an avalanche of red tape and regulation is just a start on the kind of policies that I'm confident are going to make America safe again, make America prosperous again, and mm -hmm. make America great again. And coming up next tonight, right here on Hannity. I am a man of my word. I will do as I say. President Trump shaking up Washington with a little shock and awe by keeping his promises to you, the American people. Laura Ingram is here with reaction. That's next and also later tonight. The Secretary of Homeland Security, working with myself and my staff, will begin immediate construction of a border wall. President Trump following up on his promise to build a wall on the southern border and now his administration, they've announced the timeline in which to do it. Lou Dobbs will join us later with reaction, that and more on this busy news night tonight here on Hannity. I am a man of my word. I will do as I say, something that the American people have been asking for from Washington for a very very long time. All right, that was President Trump keeping yet another promise to you, the American people, by nominating Judge Neil Gorsuch to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, President Trump is keeping his word, and as a result, lawmakers and bureaucrats in Washington, they are now feeling the heat. A new article by the AP sums this up pretty well. It reads, quote, amid Trump's shakeup, many wondering what's coming next. Joining us now with reaction, Fox News contributor Laura Ingram. Well, considering he's starting on the wall, he's starting on Obamacare, he's gone forward with regulation reform, ethics reform, uh, vetting refugees, and an refugees. originalist, I would say the rest of the list is probably what's coming next, right? I think people are 
so stunned that a politician acts in a very unpolitician-like unpolit manner. And he is a politician now. I mean, he, he surprised everyone in the election, and he's doing what he campaigned on. And for the most part, I think his, his proposals and his ideas are, are fairly popular. I know they'll cite this or that poll of, of disapproval rating. But we know on his immigration um, pause, the refugee pause, it's actually quite popular. It, it seems very common, you know, common sense to most people. So, you know, the, these various media figures and these protesters, you know, they're going to, you know, act out and have their temper tantrums because that's what they do. The rest of us have to work. Uh, you know, they're they're going to keep and shout the and wail. The rest of us and, have to work. <laughs> yeah, bay, bay at the moon. But you know, this is what they do. This is how they get their fulfillment, Sean. How do you have time to protest? I would oh never God. protest. Obama, I forgot to eat lunch as much today. as I disliked him, yeah. I have better things to do. I, I want to ask you about what I call an information crisis in the country, all right? Report today that the Neil, uh, I'm sorry, Gorsuch, the, the president's nominee for the Supreme Court, that apparently in high school he had started a fascist forever club. Fake news. The MLK bust. Fake news. Um, the Muslim ban. Well, there's 40 plus Muslim majority countries that weren't on the list fake news by all of them and it just keeps coming or that he threatened to invade mexico when speaking with president right. nieto uh it, this is getting worse by the day why do you think this is happening well i think that the, the mainstream media is very they're very frustrated because they, they thought they had trump in this box during the campaign and they thought okay we're, we've we've done him in this time or he's he made a misstep and we're going to be able to capitalize it, or the Democrats are going to trounce him, Hillary's going to win. Then they had all this egg on their face. So I think for a lot of media types on the left, they feel like now they have to prove themselves all over again. So they, they, have, to, they have to demonstrate, whether it's through misreporting or, or improper emphasis or sometimes just downright making up facts, they have to show the country that they were right. So I think it's, it's wish fulfillment on their part, sloppy reporting, and just a lack of professionalism. And, and he's a different cat. You know, Trump's, Trump's not like all these other people they've dealt with who co are cowed and, and, and suck their thumbs and, and sit on the floor and cry when the media or someone on the left goes after him. He goes after them right back. And that's, that's very uncomfortable for them. They don't know how to deal with it. All right, so he's getting rid of 75% plus of regulations in the country. He started the process of repealing, replacing Obamacare and his... Uh, executive order to ease the burden of Obamacare on people. Then he took action to freeze new and pending regulations, he said. Then he got, withdrew the U.S. from TPP. Then he instituted a government hiring freeze. Then he banned money from going to abortions or countries that pay for abortions. Then he went for Keystone. Then he went for Dakota. And then he issued executive actions on constructing the wall, uh, extreme vetting, rebuilding the military, a plan to defeat ISIS. He instituted a five-year lobbying ban to get rid of the swamp, drain the swamp, and then Neil Gorsuch. I don't know anybody in the history of my lifetime in <laughs> politics that is actually checking off his list every day and probably is wondering why he can't finish it in three more weeks. Right, I know. He's like, okay, let's get this done. What else can we do next? I, I think, again, it, he is not as deliberative, uh, some of the critics are saying, and how things are rolled out. And maybe there's, some, there's something to maybe some of uh, what happened on the, on the pause on, on refugee. But for the most part, I think this is fairly routine stuff. But he, you're right, Sean, to point out, he's hit the holy grail. Uh, of left-wing politics. He hit the abortion issue. He hit the environmental issue. Uh, he hit the regulatory state. Uh, of course, he, he hit the uh, refugee issue, the, you know, the, the Islamic, uh, Islamophobia charges flying. Uh, so he's hit all these hot-button issues, but they're actually really important issues of the country. And the, the, the left is, like, there's so much incoming I think they're they going a little crazy up. on the other side. I think they're going a little nutty on the other side. They can't, little, they can't handle it. A little it. nutty? Yeah. You know, and, now they're burning so then, in, yeah. in, in Berkeley, uh, the home of freedom of speech, or where the freedom right. of speech movement on campuses uh, began. All right. Trump urges McConnell to go nuclear if it comes to that. I agree with Donald Trump. I'm wondering about Mitch McConnell. And in fairness to him, he did hold off on on the president's nominee in the final year of his term, which is known as the Biden rule that Chuck Schumer supported.
Yeah, I mean, Merrick Garland didn't get a hearing, and the Democrats are really mad about that. But, the but that's the, the Biden last, rule. That's yeah, the last 70 years, you know, a Supreme Court justice was not confirmed in the final year of a, of a president's term. So that, that, that wasn't really out of the ordinary, but it doesn't matter. They, they wanted that seat. Now they're calling it a stolen seat. Uh, but so they're just going to keep branding actions uh, by Donald Trump as uh, misogynist, racist, sexist. Uh, it, it, it's, he's operating like a dictator, autocrat. I mean, again, there's very little substance coming from the Democrats. It's just it's, it's personal attack or, or pejorative, tactics. unfair hit. There's no substance. And I think they need to win those middle class voters, Sean. They need to win the, the, the old Rust Belt back. They have to win those voters. I don't see that this kind of stuff combined with the Berkeley craziness that is, uh, is you know, Tim Kaine the other night said, you know, you could fight, you know, the other day said fight in the streets, fight in the courts. I, I think that stuff doesn't go over well with most uh, just uh, I regular folks. I, I don't think that's going over well. I don't think Madonna, Ashley D Judd, Meryl Streep or Ashton no. Kutchner or whatever his name is, is either. Yeah. Uh, Laura, good to see you. Thank you. And up next tonight, right here on Hannity. The Secretary of Homeland Security, working with myself and my staff, will begin immediate construction of a border wall. Even talk that wall could be built in two years. President Trump promising to build that border wall. And today we found out how long it's going to take. We'll have the details. Also, Lou Dobbs will join us to react to that and more as Hannity continues straight ahead. We're in the middle of a crisis on our southern border. The unprecedented surge of illegal migrants from Central America is harming both Mexico and the United States. The Secretary of Homeland Security, working with myself and my staff, will begin immediate construction of a border wall. We are going to get the bad ones out the criminals and the drug deals and gangs and gang members and cartel leaders, the day is over when they can stay in our country and wreak havoc. All right, that was President Trump talking about the necessity of a border wall between the U.S. and Mexico. And now Homeland Security Secretary, retired General John Kelly, spoke to our own Catherine Herridge about when it would be completed. Listen to this. My desire would be right away. Uh, but reality, you know, I have to have engineers uh, look mm -hmm. at it and, and there's uh, people doing that right now. So I, I can't say when it, how long it will take. But, but before the end of this four-year administration? Oh, certainly. Oh, yeah. To, within the next two years? I'd, I'd, I'd really hope to have it done within the next two years. Here now with reaction from the Fox Business Network, our sister network, which means we're family, is our own Lou Dobbs. <laughs> well, some of us are family anyway. How are you? Absolutely, Sean. Great to be with you. Great to be with you. Are you amazed as I am at the speed of which so many, this is not a small list, right. so many of the promises that he made are being checked off. Absolutely. He is, he is fulfilling promises, which, first of all, if he had done it with two or three issues, it would have shocked most people. Mm -hmm. But here we are, not even two weeks into his presidency, he is mounting an offensive uh, in which he's uh, fulfilling those promises. He is meeting new challenges. He's taking on as continually, and it looks like it will be a constant uh, through his presidency, the opposition party that is the left-wing media. Uh, he, it's, I think, he is doing an incredible job. He's vetting refugees. He's building on the wall. He's going forward with that. An originalist to the Supreme Court a ban on lobbying for people that work for him. Right. Uh, they are building a plan now to defeat ISIS, uh, repealing and replacing Obamacare, got out of TPP immediately, instituted a government hiring freeze, um, on extreme vetting, building the military. All of those things have been right. done in 13 days. In 13 days, oh. and, and, and look at who is opposing him. Most of the people opposing him, what he's doing, the way his administration is doing it, these are the very same people who created the mess that he's trying to fix. Yeah. It is, it's incredible. And the national, then there's this closed feedback loop with the national left-wing media. They keep repeating what the Feinsteins and the Pelosi's and the Schumer's keep regurgitating uh, and, and trying to attack Trump. Do and you he, trust the Republicans are going to 
stick with him on these issues? Because I don't have a lot of faith in the Republican Congress. <laughs> you know, and I don't either. Mm -hmm. But I do have a lot of faith in Donald Trump and what he's done. He's shown them how to win. They, some of their leaders are suspect, uh, both intellectually and uh, I in would terms say of weak, the, spineless, those, those are lacking words. conviction. <laughs> we're we were, we're just different totally agreements. Agreements. Yeah, but they also know that this is a man who's winning, charting a new course, and has visualized uh, a future for the American people, to which they are now uh, counting on him. And they're counting on the Congress, and these, whether it's Paul, Paul Ryan or Mitch McConnell, yep. they're not going to disappoint. All right. Lou Dobbs, congrats on the success of your show. You're doing really Thank well you. as uh, usual. Uh, good Thank to see you. you. Great to see you. All right, coming up, we need your help. A very important question of the day is straight ahead. We really need your help. Coming up. Liberty Mutual stood with me. All right, time for a question of the day. Do you think President Obama and Hillary Clinton should step up and condemn these violent left-wing radical protesters should be a simple answer right apparently not for them just go to facebook.com slash sean hannity at sean hannity on twitter let us know what you think unfortunately that's all the time we have left this evening quick programming note tomorrow night we will be in houston houston texas ahead of sunday's super bowl between the patriots and the falcons tim tebow robert Kraft, tiki barber joe namath stephen a smith what a great lineup. They'll all join us. We'll have some football fun and much more tomorrow night from Houston. Hope you can join us. Have a great night. Tonight, the left completely unhinged. And now they've turned violent. Michelle Malkin reacts. The president made it clear in this executive order that we are not going to compromise the safety and security of the American people. The Trump administration has put the world on notice. We went to the White House today to speak with Vice President Mike Pence. And President Trump is not your typical politician. I am a man of my word. I will do as I say. And lawmakers are feeling the heat. Laura Ingram is here to weigh in. All of that, plus Lou Dobbs is here. Hannity starts right here, right now. And welcome to Hannity. And tonight, Vice President Pence, Michelle Malkin, Laura Ingram will join us. But first, we are just 14 days into the Trump administration, and the left is completely unhinged, and now they're turning violent. And that is tonight's opening monologue. Last night, out of control protesters, they were rocking the campus of UC Berkeley out in California, tapping off a chaotic two-week stretch of disruptive demonstrations. Now, UC Berkeley was forced to cancel a speech by Breitbart editor Milo Yiannopoulos after anti-free speech rioters, well, they started smashing windows, launching Molotov cocktails at police, and even setting part of the campus on fire, as you see there. Now, earlier this morning, President Trump responded to the violence. He tweeted out, quote, if UC Berkeley does not allow free speech and practices violence on innocent people with a different point of view, well, no federal funds, question mark. Now, the shocking public disorder at UC Berkeley comes after a week of protests all across the nation, some of which featured agitators calling for violence against President Trump and the White House, including this person wearing a Black Lives Matter shirt at a protest that allegedly took place in Seattle. Watch this. White people, give your money, your house, your property. We need it all. You need us reparate. Black and indigenous people right now. We're all operating under white supremacy, just so you know. And we need to start killing people. First off, we need to start killing the White House. The White House must die. The White House, your White House, your president, they must go. White House die? Why has that person not been arrested? Now, sadly, these protesters were just following the lead of many prominent public figures on the left who have been having a complete meltdown since Donald Trump's victory in November. Now, this includes celebrity snowflakes like Madonna, Ashley Judd, who delivered these very disturbing remarks at a protest. This was one day after the president was sworn into office. We've got to warn you, this language is very graphic, very vulgar. Look for yourself. To our detractors that insist that this march will never add up to anything. 
you. Yes. I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. I am a nasty woman. I'm not as nasty as a man who looks like he bathes in Cheeto dust. I am not as nasty as your own daughter being your favorite sex symbol. Now, this type of language from the left is not going away. In fact, I predict this is only going to get worse. Now, Democrats in the U.S. Senate, as we speak, they are preparing a stiff resistance to the confirmation of Supreme Court nominee Neil Gorsuch. And if history repeats itself, well, this obstruction could be just as nasty and divisive, if not worse. For example, you might remember when President Reagan, his Supreme Court nominee, Judge Robert Bork, back in 1987, he was not confirmed by the U.S. Senate. After Democrats, they painted Bork as a sexist and racist, which he was not. And Senator Ted Kennedy said this about Bork on the U.S. Senate floor. Watch this disgrace. Robert Bork's America is a land in which women would be forced into back alley abortions, blacks would sit at segregated lunch counters, rogue police could break down citizens' doors in midnight raids, and school children could not be taught about evolution. Writers and artists would be censured at the whim of government. Now, after those lies and scare tactics were used by the left, Democrats, they were able to block Bork's nomination, and that's how we ended up with the term being Borked. And that's not all. In 1991, George Herbert Walker Bush, he nominated Clarence Thomas to the U.S. Supreme Court. And Democrats, they used similar dirty tactics. In fact, they had his former colleague, Anita Hill, testify and make unfounded sexual harassment claims against him. Now, Justice Thomas referred to this as a, quote, high-tech lynching. Watch this powerful moment from Clarence Thomas. And from my standpoint, as a black American, as far as I'm concerned, it is a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks who in any way deign to think for themselves, to do for themselves, to have different ideas. And it is a message that unless you kowtow to an old order, this is what will happen to you. You will be lynched, destroyed, caricatured, by a committee of the U.S. U.S. Senate rather than hung from a tree. Sad but extremely powerful. So as Democrats now gear up to smear Judge Gorsuch and his protests continue to disrupt the law and order all across the country, here's the question. Will the leaders of the Democratic Party call for an end to this violence, an end to the lies and the smearing and besmirchment and obstruction? Now, sadly, we probably won't get a call of unity from former President Obama. He had this to say about the widespread protests after this election. Listen to this. I would not advise people who feel strongly uh, or are concerned about uh, some of the issues that have been raised during the course of the campaign. I wouldn't advise them uh, to be silent. Well, don't be silent, and he encouraged the protesters. Now, meanwhile, the Stronger Together candidate, Hillary Clinton, has praised some of the recent protests on Twitter. And let me be clear here. This is important. President Obama, Hillary Clinton, Senate House Democratic leaders, if you continue to coddle this outrage, this behavior from your side of the aisle, then the repercussions of the violence and the anarchy, it will be on your hands. You're responsible. You're supposed to be leaders. Joining us now, the host of Michelle Malkin Investigates on CRTV.com, Michelle Malkin. Um, I don't think it's going to end. I would say with every item on Trump's agenda, what he promised the American people, if it's energy, if it's borders, if it's vetting, if it's a judge, if it's lower taxes, there's going to be the same reaction. I don't see this getting better. I see it getting worse. Your thoughts? I think you're right, Sean, and I think the montage that you showed of how this dates back decades and decades emphasizes that there's nothing new about this anarchy and that obstructionism is the middle name of the Democrat Party. And the middle name of the far left is by any means necessary. That has been their operational motto for three or four decades now. What happened at Berkeley has happened many, many times before. It's just uh, more in flames than it ever has been. I spoke in Berkeley at uh, uh, an event. I was invited by the college 
Republicans in 2004. And my lecture hall had to be chained shut because there were hundreds and hundreds, throngs of students who, of course, were encouraged by uh, faculty members to try and shut me down. This is what the left does. And Clarence Thomas said it more powerfully uh, than anyone has in modern life about the uppity blacks and browns and yellows and reds uh, who have been suppressed by the left because their ideas and their expressions are so dangerous that you've got these leftists on campuses from Berkeley to the East Coast to everywhere in between threatening conservative speakers. Liberals, they call themselves the protectors of safe spaces, not if you're a conservative student, professor, or visiting speaker who needs to dress in riot gear to express yourself. You know, the free speech movement in America started in 1964 and 65 <laughs> in Berkeley. But free speech only for liberals, not for conservatives. If they didn't want to hear from the guy that works for Breitbart, they didn't have to go, did they? No, of course they didn't. Um, but this climate of intolerance and this suppression of ideas with which they disagree is at the heart of um, what academia has been teaching. That's why you have these generations of crybabies and snowflakes who, who cannot cope in a world where they lose politically, ideologically, and culturally. Well, we move from the, we, uh, we need aromatherapy and puppy therapy and crayons <laughs> and coloring books and Legos. Uh, I guess this is the next stage of their reaction, which is anger. One of the reasons every four years, in an election year, I will play every election year, Republicans are racist and sexist and misogynist and xenophobic and homophobic and Islamophobic and I don't even know what else. But they do the same thing every year. This party seems to have no ideas, meaning the Democratic Party, but they're the party of character assassination. Last word for you. Yeah, they're not only ideologically bankrupt, they're morally bankrupt. How dare these people wag their fingers at their political opponents from the center to the right to libertarian uh, wing of America and tell us that we don't know what civility is, that we need to preach more tolerance. They need to look in the mirrors because they are absolutely responsible for it. Their noses are not clean and their hands are not clean. Where's Janet Napolitano, the former Homeland Security Secretary who's in charge of the UC system? Where are you? It's really up to the donors who have been floating the endowments of so many of these private university and colleges. Shame on you for funding and subsidizing this kind of anarchy across wow. America. Michelle Malkin, thanks for being with us. CRTV.com, we appreciate it. Michelle Malkin investigates. When we come back, this is up next here on Hannity. What President Trump has done is essentially impose a pause on countries that have been compromised by terrorism so that we can evaluate uh, the screening process and establish uh, an extreme vetting so that people coming into this country don't represent a threat to our families and to our communities. Earlier today, I interviewed Vice President Mike Pence in Washington. I asked him about President Trump's temporary travel ban and much more that's coming up next. Also tonight, Laura Ingram, Lou Dobbs are here as we continue. Tonight, NYU due to an appearance by conservative actor Gavin McGinnis. He's also the co-founder of Vice Media. McGinnis was invited to attend a seminar sponsored by campus Republicans there. Protesters showed up in force.